on page 53, class. <laughs> Hello, is everybody okay back there? You all right? Okay. Um, this piece is not, uh, there are some pieces in this book that are not in the original Hanuman. I wrote this piece especially for this, um, uh, for this little volume and uh, it's a story I always wanted to tell but it was too difficult. So finally I, uh, I got it out. And um, it's uh, relatable even though I wrote it recently, of course, to the piece I just uh, wrote, because it starts speaking about the old man. 1957. His name was Harry Real, a good name for a detective. But he seemed more shaman than detective. He would sit in all weathers in the dry patch in front of his slightly tilted house with black shingles that made it look two-dimensional. He sat next to painted orange crates and sold bait, mostly minnows and worms. I never saw him anywhere else, and he only, I only saw him get up once and enter his black shape of a shack and seemingly disappear. His wife had died in 1947, and he buried her in their yard. This seemed to me an ultimate expression of being free, to be able to choose where to bury someone you love. I imagined he was sitting there, not only to sell bait, but as her guardian. He watched over her, and because she was near to him, he was also near to her. I always look forward to catching a glimpse of him, holy as he was. I wasn't supposed to go into town alone, but my mother would occasionally take me to Woodbury to get the Broad Street bus to Camden. We would pass him, and he would give me a nod. Sometimes it might be no more than a wrinkle of an eye, but I knew it was for me. In the summer of 1957, my youngest sibling, Kimberly, was born. She came 10 years after me and was a surprise to everyone, including my mother. I remember my parents leaving for the hospital. There was a commercial for paper towels on TV from the Kimberly Clark Company, and that is what my mother named her. <laughs> Got to get a name somewhere. <laughs> my mother said when she saw her face, she knew she had seen that face before, but she couldn't place it. Then she realized it was her own face, because Kimberly looked just like my mom. Kimberly was a sunny child, though she had severe asthma and a host of allergies. In our little house, we were now eight, including my mother's cat Mittens and my dog Bambi. My mother loved her cat, and I loved Bambi as myself. My dog was a good companion, intelligent, quiet, and obedient. We had brought her with us when we left Germantown to start a new life in southern New Jersey. My father used to go to the barber shop when he had some extra change to get a haircut. His barber sometimes let me sit in the big chair and trim my bangs. Somehow they were never even. One day he brought a basket of puppies into the barber shop. His miniature collie had mated with a German shepherd, accidentally. <laughs> All the pups were long-haired, except for the runt of the litter. She had the coat of a shepherd, but the markings of a collie. She, remem she resembled a small deer, so sweet and vulnerable in the basket, so I called her Bambi. My father said we couldn't afford to have another dog. I said she could eat some of my food, but he was also worried about my mother still grieving for her dog Sambo, a lively black cocker spaniel that was killed on the railroad tracks while we were gathering coal that fell from the passing railroad cars. See what would happen, we had a coal stove, this was in Germantown, and uh, coal was expensive, so if you went down to the train yard, the um, Pennsylvania Railroad, um, there was always a coal car 
and you just waited until it went by and the rattling, you know, all the rattling, a lot of coal would fall down and we'd just, you know, fill up bags and it would be enough for us. But um, Little Black Sambo, as she was called, uh, ran in front of the train and, uh, well, anyway. Sambo never listened and ran in front of the train. My mother was devastated by the loss and my father didn't think she would want another dog. But Bambi was so meek and loving that he relented. After a small flutter of protests and the fact that Mittens took a liking to her, she was given entrance to our family. I had never wanted to leave the city. Germantown was just a short trolley ride to Philadelphia where there were lots of big libraries with an infinite, infinite amount of books. But nonetheless, we moved to a little starter house in Woodbury Gardens with a pig farm and swamp to the right and an unkempt field with an old barn across the road. It was a comfort having my dog in this unknown territory. We spent long hours together as I explored the small forest lining the edge of our neighborhood. I named all I saw, Red Clay Mountain, Rainbow Creek, Punk Swamp, and they still kept the names, I'm proud to say. Yeah, we're still Red Clay Mountain and, sorry, I just had to. <laughs> there was Leif everywhere, mysterious and energetic. In time, I came to cherish our surroundings, we led our Peter Pan existence, Bambi, my spirit dog with the deep, sad eyes. Kimberly was often ill. The doctor ordered the house to be stripped of every allergen, including our precious animals. This was a terrible blow, yet I was not without understanding. I had no resentment against the baby or the doctor. We all knew it was, it was our duty to help Kimberly but the thought of giving up Mittens and Bambi was heartbreaking. I thought of running away with her, but where would we go? I could sleep in the fields shrouded at night with the invisible cloth of the wool gatherers. I could hide in the forest and build a hut in the trees and live like one of the lost boys. But I knew I could never run away and leave my siblings. I could never leave Kimberly, who would rock her when my parents were working who would watch her sleep, making certain she did not hold her breath and leave, leave us forever. The day was fast coming when the family offering to take Bambi would arrive. I vaguely knew one of them from school. The idea sickened me. In my heart, I felt a possessiveness I had never experienced. I couldn't bear the thought of someone else having my dog. I got up quite early and left the house with her. It was in my mind to take her to all the places we loved. We would take one last walk to Red Clay Mountain and stop a while by Rainbow Creek. I had a peanut butter sandwich wrapped in wax paper and some dog bis biscuits. I sat with Bambi at my feet and surveyed my domain. She would not eat her treats. She knows, I thought, she knows. I stopped trying to hide what was going to happen, and I told her everything, without words. I told her through my eyes from my heart. She licked my face, and I knew she understood. Bambi rarely barked. There was only the silence of her sad, dear eyes. Soon it was time to go back home, but first I took her to Thomas's field, and we lay in the grass and looked up at the clouds. The sun was warm on my face and I dozed. Bambi slept with her head and paw resting on my chest. I awoke and knew we had to hurry home. I could feel my mother searching me out. I ran across the fields toward home, just across the road. Bambi, Bambi darted ahead of me and I called her. She stopped suddenly in the middle of the road. I called her again, but she stayed still looking right into my eyes. Even from a distance, it was as if I could see my own reflection. I froze. I just stood there as a fire truck came racing from nowhere and struck her. The fireman stopped and got out. 
My father rushed from the house and scooped her up, laying her near the bushes, the sacred bushes of God. No one said anything. No one asked what happened. The fireman felt terrible for killing her, but I knew it wasn't his fault. I knelt down and looked at my dog. She was still warm. There was not a mark on her, not even a drop of blood. It was as if she was sleeping, but she was dead. My mother was crying. My sister Linda's astonished blue eyes dominated her compassionate face. I got an old woolen blanket and wrapped her in it. My father buried her by the side of the house and we said our prayers. I did not cry. The complexity of my feelings so profound that it lifted me above the realm of tears. I ruminated on this day for a long time. Did I wish her dead or was it her? Surely she knew. Neither of us wanted her to belong to someone else. It was Indian summer and the trees were already red and gold. As the days passed, I disobeyed my mother and bicycled across the forbidden parameter to Woodbury to find Harry real. I thought he could solve the riddle that weighed on me so heavily, the riddle of Bambi's death. Harry was the one who had identified the spirits of the field, and I believe he knew the answer to everything. But for the first time, he was not at his station guarding his widow. He wasn't there the next time either, and I never saw him again. Sometime later, I was holding Kimberly in my arms. She had had an asthma attack while my parents were out. I tended to her as I was taught and then was able to rock her to sleep. I heard some shouting from across the road. The sun was going down and I stepped outside. The old black barn was in flames. I heard a terrible screeching. Someone said it was bats burning alive. I stood there cradling the baby. The sky was purple with golden streaks. I could see the planets and the evening star. Hovering above the field were swarms of gnats and fireflies. Pale lunar moths circled the night lights with a life of their own. My brother raced across the road. Nothing is more exciting for a young boy than a fire. Yet I knew the flames wouldn't spread. The barn would burn and leave its mark, but the field was safe, for the wool gatherers would protect it, just as Harry Reel had protected his wife and I was protecting Kimberly. The baby awoke and smiled at me. It occurred to me that nothing was more beautiful than a newborn smile. So I included the lyrics to this song from Horses because obviously this little story tells the um, root of uh, where the song came from. So I'll just read the lyrics. Kimberly, the wall is high, the black barn, the babe in my arms in her swaddling clothes, and I know soon that the sky will split and the planets will shift, balls of jade will drop, and existence will stop. Little sister, the sky is falling. I don't mind, I don't mind. Little sister, the fates are calling on you. Ah, here I stand again, in this old electric whirlwind. The sea rushes up my knees like flame, and I feel just like some misplaced Joan of Arc. And the cause is you, looking up at me. Ah, baby, I remember when you were born. It was dawn and the storm settled in my belly. And I rolled in the grass and I spit out the gas. And I lit a match and the void went flash and the sky split. And the planets hit. Balls of jade dropped. And existence stopped. Little sister, the sky has fallen. I don't mind. I don't mind. Little sister, the fates are calling on you. 
I was young and crazy. So crazy I knew I could break through with you. So with one heart, with one hand I rocked you. With one heart I reached for you. And I knew your youth was for the taken, fire on the metal plane. So I ran through the fields as the bats with their baby vein faces burst in flames in the violent violet sky. And I fell on my knees and pressed you against me. Your soul was like a network of spittle, like glass balls moving in like cold streams of logic. And I prayed as the lightning attacked that something would make it go crack. Something would make it go crack. Something would make it go crack. The palm trees fall into the sea. It doesn't matter much to me as long as you're safe, Kimberly, and I can gaze deep into your starry eyes.